the last talk of the day, uh, we are going back to a natural science, physics. Uh, our speaker is uh, Scott Aronson from MIT. When uh, one of the first times I met Scott, he told me why he was interested in physics. Uh, it's because, you know, as a kid, instead of playing computer games, he was learning physics because he thought the world is, uh, is like a computer game, but it had much more realistic special effects. Uh, Scott was a, a postdoc uh, in my group at IAS some years ago, uh, and uh, I can tell you lots of stories, more stories than I can tell you about uh, the other speakers, but I won't. Uh, I, uh, I mentioned, uh, first of all, he just uh, published a book that you should get, it's called uh, quantum computing since Democritus, and that's uh, going along a, a course that he's taught uh, for several years at MIT and in Waterloo, uh, which is much more than just a book about quantum computing. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, his blog. He's uh, an extremely popular blogger. Uh, most of the topics uh, have to do with the boundary between physics and computation, but you will find them you'll find there practically anything. And uh, I, I just remember that I mentioned the Google uh, algorithms, PageRank and Hitz algorithm of Kleinberg. Uh, just as an example, you can, uh, of the blog, uh, you know, issues or the quirky mind of Scott is, uh, you can read his uh, blog post on Eigen Morality evolving from this. Uh, Google algorithm. So anyway, let me uh, ask you to welcome Scott Aronson. Okay, yeah, the mic is on. Okay, so uh, thanks so much, Avi. Uh, it's great to be back here. So, um, uh, so I'd like to tell you about computational phenomena in physics. Now, uh, when I did a uh, Google image search for quantum computer, uh, this is one of the first things that came up. Uh, you know, for, for all I know, that, that, you know, maybe that's what they look like. I mean, I'm, 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 a, I'm a theorist, I'm not an engineer. Uh, you know, this, this is one of the few places where I guess I, I don't have to apologize for that. Uh, but uh, uh, the one, um, the, uh, the one other thing that I uh, wanted to do, just, just in order to continue the uh, convention that was established this morning, uh, here is John von Neumann. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, not only did he uh, here at IAS uh, build some of the first electronic computers, but he was also one of the great uh, systematizers of quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, so much so that, you know, many people have like uh, uh, pondered the question, why did von Neumann not invent quantum computing back in the 1950s? And the only answer to that seems to be, well, you know, he, he had a lot on his plate and he didn't get around to it. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right. So my starting point is that you know there are certain uh, technologies that would be great, but that we you know never seem to see. Uh, first of these, you know, warp drive. <laughs> you know, where is it? We've been waiting. You know, I've been you know uh, uh, you know ju uh, just saw uh, the movie Interstellar. You know, I would settle for a wormhole. Uh, uh, um, you know, perpetual motion machine, you know, where is it? Okay, and then the third is what I'm going to call the Uber computer. You know, this is a device that, uh, uh, it doesn't, uh, necessarily tell you the meaning of life or anything like that, but, you know, any well-posed mathematical question, it just instantly tells you the answer to, so just, you know, Goldbach's conjecture. So, um, Okay, so now in the first two cases, you know, uh, uh, we know something about why these sorts of machines haven't been built, right? It's not just a matter of engineering difficulty. Uh, it's really something fundamental about the laws of physics. In the first case, it's uh, special relativity, or we could say, you know, the causal structure of space-time. Uh, in the second case, it's the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, and so uh, what I wonder about is what about the third case? You know, uh, what are the fundamental physical limits on uh, what can be feasibly computed. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and for, you know, moreover, you know, do those limits then have any implications uh, back for physics, as, you know, uh, uh, as is certainly true in the first two cases. 
Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so as, as Avi uh, sort of uh, eloquently uh, told us uh, this morning, sort of the first pass, you know, we could make at, a, at an answer to this question is uh, uh, the, the, well, the church touring thesis or its sort of modern complexity formulation. So the, the church touring thesis basically said that, you know, any th uh, physically realistic uh, computing device can, can be simulated by a touring machine. The extended church touring thesis, or ECT, uh, adds the proviso uh, with at most a polynomial overhead in time and memory. Okay, so, uh, uh, and you know, it hedges a little bit on whether the simulation uh, uh, has to be deterministic or whether it can be probabilistic, but you know, as uh, um, uh, Avi, among others, have has, uh, taught us, those are very likely to be the same thing anyway. So, uh, um, so, uh, uh, you know, so this is a, a, you know, a very, you know, an extremely audacious uh, thesis, you know, the extended version, um, much, much, you know, even more so than the original one. And so, you know, it, it behoo uh, uh, you know, and really bridging the two worlds of computer science and physics because, you know, it's, uh, uh, talks about computability, but ultimately, of course, this is really, you know, a question about nature. You know, we could imagine a universe where, you know, the halting problem was solvable for free. That just doesn't seem to be uh, the physical world that we live in. Okay, so, uh, so then it behooves us to ask, well, you know, how sure are we of this extended church touring thesis? You know, what would it look like for it to be overturned? You know, what would a, a challenge to this ECT look like? Uh, well, so let me run you through, you know, a few uh, sort of just purely classical examples of what challenges to the uh, extended church touring thesis would look like. Okay, so the first, you know, here's a very, you know, a really nice old proposal from the 1970s, okay, uh, that uh, you would, you could uh, uh, just take two glass plates and put pegs between them in whatever pattern you like and then dip the resulting configuration into a tub of soapy water and then take it out. Okay, and you'll find soap bubbles that are forming between the pegs and, you know, like any bubbles, they'll try to sort of relax to a minimum energy state. In this case, the minimum energy state ought to be uh, what we would call the, uh, the minimum Steiner tree, which is just the minimum total length of line segments connecting these points in the plane where the line segments could meet at intermediate points uh, like these. Um, and now, uh, uh, the, you know, there is something curious about this, which is that minimum Steiner tree is well known to be an NP-hard problem, okay? So, you know, which means that, you know, one could take any other uh, combinatorial search problem. For example, you know, find me a proof of the Riemann hypothesis in, you know, first order logic with, you know, at most 100 million symbols. And one could encode that problem into a suitable configuration of pegs that you then <laughs> dip, dip into your soapy water. So then, so then one wonders, you know, if one does this, what will happen? You know, well, you know, that has one then just sort of, you know, uh, uh, forced, you know, nature to, you know, prove the Riemann hypothesis for you, or you know, do do what, uh, you know, our 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 both our, our our greatest, you know human brains and our great, you know, fastest computers have thus far not been able to do. So, you know, so there was a discussion about this on the internet, you know, a, a decade ago where, uh, you know, some um, uh, people said, well, you know, yeah, a lot of people think that this wouldn't work, uh, but, you know, but this is just sort of, you know, an academic, you know, dog, this just shows computer scientists' narrow-mindedness, right, that they, you know, you know, I bet not one of them ever tried it. This, the, the, you know, the, 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 the comment actually led to the one foray into experimental physics in my life. Uh, so, um, so, so I, uh, um, it was a pain getting this thing through airport security. I used to, you know, uh, uh, bring it around and demonstrate it. But, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's a really cool experiment. You should try it at home. Uh, you know, when you have only three or four pegs, what you find is that typically, uh, uh, the soap bubbles do relax to the minimum Steiner tree. You know, they do solve this kind of cool optimization problem, okay? Then you start adding more pegs, five pegs, six pegs, seven pegs, and then what you start to see is that the bubbles can get stuck in a suboptimal configuration, okay? And in fact, you know, sometimes they'll form a structure which is not even a tree at all. It contains an intermediate cycle, which then, which then proves that it can't be optimal. Okay, so uh, 
Uh, so, so indeed, you know, it seems that, you know, uh, that, you know, I mean, I didn't try every possible brand of soap, but, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's some evidence that uh, nature <laughs> is not solving, you know, NP hard problems by magic in this sort of way. Now, this, this may sound silly, but, you know, again and again, you will read things like, you know, putting in, you know, serious scientific papers. Well, you know, na like uh, uh, proteins, when they fold into their lowest energy configuration, they're solving an NP hard problem. Okay, you know, and you, like, any time you hear something like that, you know, you ought to be asking yourself, what's the catch? Okay, and, you know, in this case, uh, you know, in, in the case of protein folding, the catch is very interesting. Uh, it's that, um, well, first of all, there was extremely strong selection pressure on proteins to evolve in such a way that, you know, they have, uh, that th th they fold pretty easily. I mean, a protein for which you had to prove the Riemann hypothesis to figure out how to fold it would just not be a very good protein, okay? <laughs> but even then, there are proteins that fold into suboptimal configurations. So uh, prions, which are the agent of mad cow disease, appear to be an example of that. Okay, so, uh, uh, but, you know, in general, uh, you know, physicists know that, you know, syst uh, systems in nature can get stuck in metastable states. I mean, if you put a rock in some crevice on a mountainside, it could reach a lower state of potential energy by rolling up first and then rolling down. But, you know, it's rarely observed to do that. <laughs> so, you know, with the soap bubbles and with the proteins, it's, you know, uh, maybe it's more abstract, but I think it's ultimately a similar story. Okay, but now, um, so if not that, you know, I mean, you've all heard about quantum computers, and we'll get to that, but, you know, what about the uh, uh, neglected other great theory of the 20th century? What about the relativity computer? Okay, so the idea of the relativity computer is uh, extremely simple. It's that you would start your computer just working on some, you know, extremely hard problem of your choice. Then you would leave your computer on Earth, you would board a spaceship, which is traveling at very close to uh, the speed of light. Uh, you would fly around, then you would decelerate, you would return to Earth. Now, in Earth's frame, billions of years would have passed. You know, civilization would have collapsed. Really, you know, your friends would be long dead. Uh, but, you know, if you could somehow still find your computer and it was still, you know, <laughs> hadn't uh, been incinerated by the sun or whatever, then, you know, you could read out the answer to your hard problem. Okay, so, you know, this raises an obvious question, you know, which is, well, you know, why don't people try this? Uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, if you're worried about your friends being dead, just bring them on the spaceship with you, right? So, uh, well, you know, uh, okay, or, you know, more seriously, we can ask, you know, is there any problem of principle, you know, to, to doing this? And, uh, and I think, you know, the very interesting answer is, is, is yes. I mean, you know, when you look at just, you know, again and again, we find that, you know, if you just look at one or two aspects of the laws of physics and ignore all the others, it can look like you get these sort of unbounded computational speed-ups. And then you take into account what else we know about physics and, you know, uh, and, and those things put constraints. So in this case, uh, I, I would argue that the key thing that we've ignored is energy. Okay? How much energy does it take to accelerate to, you know, that close to the speed of light that you would get an exponential computational speed up? Well, you can calculate that. You find that you would have to, you know, uh, get, go, go so fast that your di the difference between your speed and that of light would be exponentially small. Okay, to do that requires an exponential amount of energy, uh, which means, you know, uh, just to fuel up your spaceship, you know, that already takes exponential time. Uh, you know, or even for the, in fact, even for the fuel from the far away part of the tank to sort of send a signal to you, to affect you, takes exponential time. So we've sort of traded one exponential blow up in resources for a different one. Okay. Uh, you know, and this is, a, I think, a very paradigmatic example. Okay. Uh, you know, so now um, another example um, I'd like to talk about is a, uh, what I'll call Zeno's computer. You know, there's actually an entire literature on something called, called hypercomputing, okay? And, and the basic idea of all of it is, 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 is this. You know, wouldn't it be great if we could build a computer that just did the first step of its operation in one second, the next step in half a second, the next step in a quarter second, next in an eighth second, and so on, so that after two seconds it would have done infinitely many steps. Uh, you know, again, we can ask, well, you know, uh, why don't people try it? 
And, you know, and, and in this case, I, th I think the answer is that in some sense they do try it. I mean, there's a whole community of people who uh, try to overclock their microprocessor, right? They run it at a faster speed than it's, you know, uh, supposed to be run at. Okay, but many of you might know the danger in doing that, which is that if you run your uh, processor uh, too fast, uh, then you know it will overheat, it will melt. You know this is this is why your computer has a fan. Uh, this is also you know why uh, supercomputers are often cooled using you know uh, uh, liquid nitrogen or whatever. Okay. Uh, so in general, you know one once again finds a trade-off. Okay, that uh, the faster you would like to safely run your microchip, uh, the uh, the, the, the more it has to be cooled, the closer it has to be to absolute zero. The more you want to cool it, uh, the more energy that takes, the more energy you have to pump in. Um, and, you know, we could ask, what is the fundamental limit here? You know, how fast in principle could a computer be run? Okay, well, so, you know, strictly speaking, we, uh, uh, we don't know, but actually, you know, physicists have a, a, a pretty, you know, a good idea of where, you know, you're probably going to run into a, a fundamental limit. So, you know, if you were to run your computer so fast that it did uh, more than 10 to the 43 operations per second, or about, you know, one operation per Planck time, then, you know, one can calculate that one would have to concentrate so much energy into so small of a space in order to run it that fast that your computer, uh, you know, th this, this energy would gravitate. Uh, your computer would exceed what's called the Schwarzschild limit, which means that it would collapse to a black hole. Okay, so, uh, you know, I've always liked that as nature's way of telling you uh, not to do something. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, another uh, nice idea is the, uh, uh, the time travel computer. Um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, um, idea here is, is, is very simple. Uh, you know, like uh, there's this, you know, standard thought experiment where what if you could just go back in time and dictate Shakespeare's plays to him? And, you know, so then he would say, oh, thank you, now I don't have to write them anymore. And uh, so then, you know, he would just, you know, crib the plays from you, and then, you know, he would publish them as, as his own, and then, you know, they would come down to you. You know, now notice that this is actually very different from the, gra from the famous grandfather paradox, because there's no actual logical inconsistency in this story, right? You know, you get the plays, you send the plays back, everything's consistent. Right? You know, if you like, the only paradox here is one of computational hardness. You know, somehow Hamlet appears without anyone ever going to the trouble of writing it. Okay? Uh, you know, and actually, again, you know, the movie Interstellar has a... Well, all right, I shouldn't give away the ending. <laughs> so, um, so uh, sorry. But, um, uh, but okay, but, it, you know, it, it should come as no surprise that, you know, if we lived in a world with closed time-like curves, then, you know, one could uh, generically exploit a similar effect to solve hard computational problems. So, for example, you know, if you had some NP-complete problem, then you could just feed in one guessed solution into your closed time-like curve, and then <coughs> um, have uh, a computer inside the closed time-like curve, which um, uh, if checks if the solution is correct. If it is correct, then just sends it back in time, unchanged. Uh, and if it's incorrect, then increments it by one and sends that back in time. Okay, and now we say, look, um, in order to prevent a grandfather paradox, nature has to find some sort of consistent evolution around the closed time-like curve, right? But given the rules I just said, the only consistent evolutions are the ones in which a solution to your NP-complete problem just miraculously appears inside the closed time-like curve. Okay, uh, so, you know, in fact, one could do, you know, even more using this technique. So, uh, uh, John Watrous and I had a paper where we worked out exactly what could be done. Uh, we showed that you could, in fact, solve uh, P-space complete problems uh, using only a polynomially long computation inside of a, a, a closed time-like curve. On the other hand, uh, you can't do more than that. Uh, you know, not even with a quantum computer, you know, in case you were wondering. So, um, this is not the paper I based my tenure case on, by the way. But. <laughs> okay, all right, but at some point, you know, I should come to quantum mechanics. And here, you know, uh, you know many, <coughs> I think many people, you know, have gotten the impression that quantum mechanics is somehow, you know, um, complicated, uh, hard or something. I mean, you know, okay, if you want to know, you know, 
the ground states of, you know, interesting molecules or, you know, you want to do quantum field theory. Yes, that can get complicated. But, uh, you know, the, the big secret, uh, I think, has come out more and more in the last a uh, couple decades is that quantum mechanics is actually incredibly simple uh, once you take the physics out of it. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the way that, uh, we, you know, in computer science, uh, you know, the way that we tend to look at quantum mechanics through the computational lens uh, is uh, that it's, it's just a certain generalization of the laws of probability. Okay? It is, um, it's sort of if someone asked you to invent something which was like probability theory, but instead of being based on real numbers between zero and one, it should be based on complex numbers. And instead of being based on the one norm of vectors, it should be based on the two norm. Okay, then, you know, you've, you've, they've more or less forced you to invent quantum mechanics. Okay, and, you know, and so, like, by that reasoning, you know, I, I like to imagine that, that mathematicians could have come up with this by pure thought. In fact, they didn't, but, you know, in, in, some, in some alternate universe, um, they did. Okay, so, well, you know, a little more detail. Uh, um, probability theory, uh, you know, is a theory where you describe, if you, you know, you describe your, your state of knowledge about a system by a vector of non-negative non real numbers, which all add up to one. And then if something happens to the system, then you change your uh, representation of its state by taking that vector and multiplying it by uh, a matrix that always maps probability vectors to other probability vectors. You know, we call that a stochastic matrix. <coughs> okay, uh, quantum mechanics, almost the same thing, except now our vectors are vectors of complex numbers where, uh, you know, that have unit norm. Uh, some of, you know, their squared absolute values is one. And if something happens that changes the system, then you uh, multiply this vector by a matrix that uh, always maps unit vectors to other unit vectors. We call such a matrix a unitary matrix. Okay, and then the one other thing to say is that if you look at the system, that you're going to see the ith outcome with probability equal to the absolute value of alpha i squared. Right, those are, and, and furthermore, you know, you then look at it as, if you see it in the state i, you look at it a second time, it will still be in state i. It's just, it's made up its mind. Okay, so, you know, you're looking, uh, uh, collapses the state. Okay, those are the rules of quantum mechanics. Okay, but, but what about quantum computing? All right, well, um, if we think about it, uh, you know, what quantum mechanics really says is that you've got to assign one of these complex numbers, we, uh, we call them amplitudes, uh, to every possible configuration that uh, a system could be found in uh, on measuring it. Okay, so if you had a computer with n bits in its memory, what this is saying is that uh, you would have to describe its state in general using a vector of 2 to the n amplitudes. Okay, one for every possible string of bits. And um, this is just uh, the, uh, the, the, the notation that uh, physicists like to use for vectors. It's called the Dirac-Ket notation. And, you know, some of us, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, th I think this is like the single greatest hurdle for computer scientists to overcome in, 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 in learning modern physics is that you have to write vectors this way. Okay, but, uh, uh, but you know, but, but, you, but you really get used to it. It's really a good notation. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, now, now this, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, it's just to, you know, so what we're saying is that just to represent a general state of a thousand measly particles, nature sort of off to the side somewhere sort of has to, you know, be writing down two to the thousand complex numbers on some scratch paper. Right, and then any time something happens to these particles, you know, all of these two to the thousand numbers get, you know, crossed off and replaced by new numbers. Right, you know, I mean, this is more numbers than there, than there are uh, particles in the observable universe. Okay, so this is really a staggering claim about, you know, uh, about the physical world. You know, it, you know, maybe it's even, you know, the most staggering claim that quantum mechanics makes. And it's sort of amazing that, you know, although, you know, there are people like Schrodinger who sort of recognize this already in the 1920s. You know, it took a long time for, I think, just, you know, the full enormity uh, of this to really sink in on people. Uh, so uh, chemists and physicists actually, you know, uh, recognized this for, for quite a while, mostly as a practical problem. 
you know, if you're trying to simulate quantum mechanics on a classical computer, you know, for example, because you want to know what some, you know, the rate at which some chemical reaction is going to happen, you know, then, uh, you know, you've got to double the uh, size of your simulation with each new particle that you add. Okay, and so, you know, chemists and physicists invented all kinds of incredibly clever tricks for trying to cope with that uh, exponentiality. Some of them, like the uh, density functional theory, were, you know, rewarded with Nobel Prizes. Okay, but, um, you know, uh, 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 it was really Feynman, I think, who uh, brought to everyone's attention, you know, this, uh, in retrospect, you know, absolutely fundamental question, well, which is, you know, uh, 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 you know, is there, uh, uh, you know, is there any way to, exp you know, avoid this exponentiality, right? Is there just, is there a fast classical algorithm to simulate quantum mechanics which would work in general? And if there isn't, then why not turn that on its head? Why not <coughs> then build computers that would themselves exploit the same principle of quantum superposition, you know, and that, uh, um, uh, you know, now, okay, you can ask, supposing we did that, what would those computers be good for? Well, Feynman was able to give only one example. Uh, they would be good for simulating quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, um, you know, but, you know, I mean, uh, 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 you know, that, that, that sounds kind of uh, silly, but I, I actually I think that if we do ever get practical quantum computers, that will still be the most important uh, real application of them. Okay, because quantum simulation, as I said, is something that has huge applications to, you know, designing better photovoltaics, to uh, uh, understanding high temperature superconductivity, to uh, understanding protein folding, to, uh, um, you know, d uh, maybe designing new, you know, biomolecules, uh, uh, new drugs, uh, to, you know, uh, understanding high energy physics. Okay, so, um, and, you know, lots and lots of computer time is used today for, you know, trying to simulate quantum mechanics and we're, you know, we are very, very confident that a quantum computer, if built, could give you very significant speed ups for that. Okay, but the question remained, you know, can a quantum computer solve any classical problems faster than a classical computer could do it? Uh, uh, so, um, as many of you have probably heard, uh, Peter Shore showed uh, uh, 20 years ago that, uh, 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 well, the, the, uh, there is an example of that. Uh, you know, a quantum computer could um, uh, find the periods of, uh, uh, of, of exponentially long periodic sequences uh, in polynomial time. Uh, you know, and that sounds a little abstruse, but that has certain applications, such as factoring integers, uh, discrete logarithm, thereby breaking uh, essentially all of the public key cryptography uh, used in the world today. So that made people interested in this, you know, <laughs> uh, subject who, who hadn't been previously. Um, okay, so now, you know, the obvious question that anyone asks is, well, okay, but can quantum computers actually be built? Uh, well, um, you know, I mean, they already have been. Uh, quantum computers uh, have successfully demonstrated uh, the factoring of 21 into 3 times 7 uh, with high statistical confidence. Uh, that's <laughs> you know, after only, you know, about a, you know, a billion dollars of effort uh, in, in this field. Um, you know, and, you know, we, we, we you know, uh, uh, my experimentalist friends, you know, hope to be able to do 35 uh, before too long. Okay, so, uh, um, okay, so, you know, so then, you know, pe people ask, well, okay, well, why is scaling it up so hard? Uh, you know, but there's a, a very, very well understood answer to that. Uh, you know, it's because of uh, something called decoherence, okay, which basically just means unwanted interaction between a quantum computer and its external environment, which sort of prematurely measures the quantum state and forces it back down to being classical, sort of, you know, before you were ready, before you were ready to measure the answer. Okay, so um, I should, you know, say something here. Uh, 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 you know, the, uh, you know, the way that a, uh, a quantum computer would work, right, it's a computer whose state would be, you know, this superposition state, this gigantic vector of amplitudes, okay, and, you know, the, uh, the, the entire uh, um, idea of it is that you would try to choreograph a pattern of constructive and destructive interference between these amplitudes, right, where you would get all of the different sort of paths that lead to uh, each wrong answer, 
So some have positive amplitude and others have negative amplitude so that on the whole they mostly cancel each other out. Whereas the paths leading to the right answer should reinforce each other. Okay, so that's, you know, it's a very subtle uh, kind of uh, very delicate effect that you're trying to go for. You know, uh, uh, Shor showed, ama you know, amazingly that for the factoring problem, uh, you can actually choreograph the right kind of interference pattern. You can get it to work, um, you know, by taking advantage of very sort of special mathematical properties of the factoring problem. Okay, however, if the computer were to be, uh, uh, were to interact too much with its external environment, sort of before, you know, uh, the end, then, uh, then it would no longer be in a superposition state, okay? It would merely be in just a classical probabilistic mixture, which means, you know, it's just in, you know, one thing or it's the other thing, right? So like when, you know, when any, um, uh, 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 like, you know, when most popular books, you know, talk about like uh, Schrodinger's cat, for example, right? They say, you know, they basically just say, look, there's some cat in a box and you don't know whether it's alive or dead. And then you open the box and then you find out. <laughs> you know, this by itself is not, you know, surprising. Okay, <laughs> let's be clear about that, right? If that were all there was to quantum mechanics, then people would not be yammering on about it for a hundred years. Okay, the, you know, the interesting part, of course, is that you can do a different kind of experiment where the two different branches of the cat, the alive and the dead branch, would interfere with each other. You know, they would each, uh, you know, because these amplitudes, you know, work in a different way than classical probabilities do. Because they're based on the two norm rather than on the one norm, you know, they, they add up in different ways. And, uh, you know, they could, uh, uh, for example, uh, cancel out and, um, you know, and cause, you know, uh, uh, certain outcomes, you know, that you would have expected classically uh, not to happen at all. You know, others to happen with much greater probability. So, but you know, but now if someone is looking at your quantum computer as it's operating, then you know, then 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 it then it's you know it reverts to being in a classical state. So it's as if you know the cat is merely either alive or dead, and you don't know which. Or it's it's as if you merely had uh, a classical computer with access to a random number generator. Okay, and uh, so um, you know, and and again, you know. Uh, um, you know, I think it's really unfortunate the way that quantum computing tends to get described in the popular press because, you know, it again doesn't sort of differentiate quantum computing from that really. Like, you know, they, you know, you've, I'm sure that you've seen articles where it says, well, uh, you know, the way a quantum computer would work is just by trying, you know, each possible solution in a different parallel universe. Okay, well, the trouble with that is, um, you know, yes, you could do that, but then when you make a, you know, if you did, you know, I mean, you can create a superposition over all the different answers. But if you did that, you know, and then you measured, then you would simply see a random answer. And, you know, if you, all you wanted was a random answer, you could have just picked one yourself with, with, with a lot less difficulty. Okay, so, so again, you know, everything depends on this effect of interference. And interference depends on your quantum computer being extremely well isolated from its external environment. Um, Okay, uh, um, you know, now um, uh, a few, you know, the, in fact, there are even a few skeptics, you know, I mean, the problem is so hard that a few skeptics in computer science and physics, uh, you know, have argued that it, it must be fundamentally impossible, right? Um, you know, and uh, so, so, so in fact, you know, uh, in, in the 90s, you know, this, this, you know, seemed like it might be true, right? That, you know, that you, you could never keep anything perfectly isolated from its external environment for too long. Certainly not something as big and complicated as a computer factoring a number, right? So how is this ever going to work? Okay, so then, you know, in the, um, also, you know, in, in a few years later, an enormous discovery was made, uh, which was called a uh, quantum fault tolerance. Okay, so what was found is that actually, in order to do quantum computation, you don't have to keep your uh, computer perfectly isolated from its environment. Basically, it's enough to keep it pretty well isolated, okay? Even if every qubit at every step, you know, at every time step has, say, a one in a thousand chance of just being measured or, you know, uh, uh, collapsing, having its state collapse, uh, you can correct for that. You can encode your, you know, the stuff you care about 
in, in very non-local degrees of freedom, sort of spread out across many qubits using very, very clever uh, quantum error correcting codes. You can then repeatedly make measurements that will tell you whether an error has happened or not, but that won't tell you the state of your computer, which of course you don't want to know, okay? And if an error has been made, then you can correct it, thereby preserving the quantum information for an arbitrarily long time. Okay, now, uh, you know, in order to do this, you know, you've got to be able to get the decoherence down to, you know, uh, sort of a certain critical point where, you know, we're, uh, which, which we're not at yet, okay, at least not in a scalable way. Okay, but, you know, the experimentalists are orders of magnitude closer to that point than they were, let's say, 15 years ago. Okay, so I think that's really the right metric to be looking at right here and not the metric of how large a number has been factored. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to use the analogy, but like building a nuclear weapon, right? You know, you build half of, you know, you have half a critical mass, you don't get half an explosion, right? So, um, you know, so the real goal here is to control the decoherence well enough that you can start doing error correction where you're correcting the errors, uh, correcting the decoherence faster than you're introducing more decoherence into the system. And once you pass that point, then if, you know, uh, uh, you know, physicists understand quantum mechanics like, like they think they do, then at that point you ought to be able to just scale up to as many qubits as you want, you know, and, you know, operating for as long as you want. Okay, now, you know, now, you know, there are skeptics who understand all that, but they say it's still never going to work. Okay, because, you know, there must be some kind of highly correlated decoherence that violates the assumptions of these fault tolerance theorems. Or if not that, you know, then it must be that quantum mechanics itself is going to break down just in order to prevent quantum computers from working because it's just too implausible, right? And so at that point, the only thing that I can say is, well, I really hope you're right, <laughs> okay? Because if you're right, that's a thousand times more exciting than if quantum computers merely turn out to be possible. Okay, you know, now I tend to be a scientific conservative, right? So I, you know, I'm betting on the more boring possibility, which is, yeah, we can probably just build quantum computers, you know, if we care, you know, if we care enough or w want badly enough to do it, you know, they'll probably work as the theory says. Okay, but, you know, if not, then that, you know, we would have to rewrite all the physics books to explain why not. And, uh, you know, and actually for me, you know, I like to say that, you know, the single most important application of a quantum computer, even more important than quantum simulation, is disproving the people who said it was impossible, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the rest is icing, right? You know, I mean, if, if we could spend, you know, $11 billion to find the Higgs boson, right, then certainly, you know, to put quantum mechanics itself to this most severe test that it's, you know, ever been put to. And by the way, you know, we talk about the computational lens, right? If trying to build a quantum computer led to a revision in quantum mechanics, that would be like the most staggering contribution of computer science of physics, uh, to physics that you could possibly imagine. I don't expect it to happen. Okay, but now um, let me come to a really key point, okay, which is that, you know, even today, after we, you know, some of us have been sort of, you know, trying to explain this for 15 years, you know, lots and lots of people seem to have the impression that a, a quantum computer would just solve any NP-complete problem that you want in polynomial time, okay, that that's what it would do, okay? But it's crucial to realize here that factoring uh, the problem that Shor solved is neither known nor believed uh, to be an NP-complete problem. Okay, it has, you know, very, very special properties, like, you know, uh, the least of which is that, you know, every uh, uh, positive integer has exactly one prime factorization, you know, which Euclid proved 2,300 years ago. Okay, but, you know, lots and lots of uh, number theoretic properties that seem to prevent it from being NP-complete. Okay, and um, today, uh, most of us actually uh, don't believe that quantum computers will in general be able to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time any more than we believe classical computers can, okay, can. I mean, now, not surprisingly, we have no proof of this, because, you know, because we can't even prove classical computers can't solve them. That's the P versus NP question, okay? But, um, 
you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, once you understand how quantum algorithms work and, you know, the need to rely on this very, very subtle interference effect, uh, you know, um, it, it, it looks kind of, you know, almost as implausible that they could solve NP-complete problems as that a classical computer uh, would be able to do it efficiently. Uh, okay, one thing that we do know here is an important result of Bennett, Bernstein, Brassard, and Vazirani uh, from the 90s. And what they showed is that if you just threw away all the structure of an NP-complete problem and just thought of it as an abstract space of two to the n possible solutions, where the only thing you knew how to do was to query a black box that for each solution just told you whether it was correct or not. Okay, and now the only catch is that you're allowed to ask this black box a superposition of questions, you know, and get a superposition of answers, you know, and you can do that repeatedly. Okay, in this case, we can show that uh, uh, even a quantum computer will need exponential time to solve an NP-complete problem in this way. Specifically, it's going to need at least two to the n over two steps, okay, where, you know, compared to the two to the n steps that a classical computer would need, because it's just you know, in this case, it really is just looking for a needle in a haystack. Okay, now very, very interestingly, this two to the n over two turns out to be achievable. So you may have heard, <coughs> um, after Shor's algorithm, uh, the second most famous uh, quantum algorithm is called Grover's search algorithm. And uh, that one searches any list of, say, m elements in only square, about square root of m steps. Okay, so it doesn't achieve an exponential speed up, right? It merely achieves a square root speed up compared to what you could do classically. So, that, you know, that seems less impressive than Shor's algorithm, but its range of applicability is just enormously wider. Okay, it applies to sort of any, any kind of search task uh, uh, whatsoever. Okay, um, but of course, you know, the square root of two to the 10,000 is two to the 5,000. So, you know, so this is not turning exponentials into polynomials. Okay, so now, uh, if we really wanted to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time using a quantum computer, then uh, we know that, uh, for, uh, from Bennett et al., that, uh, uh, you know, we would need an algorithm that somehow exploited their structure, um, just as a classical algorithm would have to. Okay, and this is where the story gets really interesting because um, there's a, there is a beautiful proposal for a, a quantum algorithm that would tr try to solve NP-complete problems uh, quickly by exploiting their structure. Uh, it's called the quantum adiabatic algorithm. Uh, it was invented uh, about uh, uh, 15 years ago by my colleague Ed Farhi and uh, some of his collaborators. Since then, they've just, you know, been trying to understand what it does. Uh, so um, you can think of this algorithm as like uh, the quantum version of simulated annealing, uh, if you know what that is. So uh, it is a, a, a heuristic algorithm. It's not guaranteed to work. You know, in fact, you know, as I'll show you, it, you know, uh, there are, seem to be, you know, definitely cases where it doesn't work. Uh, but it's something that you can try out, you know, to see what happens. And so the idea is that you start out by uh, uh, applying uh, certain, um, uh, you, um, uh, um, uh, um, applying, you know, certain interactions to a, a, a collection of qubits, what physicists uh, call a Hamiltonian. Uh, for me, a Hamiltonian is just the thing that you raise e to to get a unitary matrix. Uh, but um, so you start out by you know applying a certain Hamiltonian, and now you know in physics, uh, you know systems like to live in the ground state of their Hamiltonian, which means like their their lowest energy configuration. Okay, so you have your system start out in the ground state of its initial Hamiltonian. Okay, and then you slowly vary what Hamiltonian you're applying. So like, you know, uh, this might mean like just slowly changing what magnetic field you're applying to, you know, a collection of, uh, uh, of spins in your, in your spin lattice, for example. Uh, and you end up um, applying some final Hamiltonian, HF. But HF is designed so that its ground state encodes the solution to an NP-complete problem of interest to you. Okay, now um, there's uh, something called the adiabatic theorem, 
which says that as long as you transition between HI and HF slowly enough, uh, you're going to always stay in the ground state, which, you know, near, near the ground state, which means that you're going to end, you know, very close to the ground state of H sub F, and you're going to get the solution to your NP complete problem. Okay, so from this perspective, the only question is, you know, how slowly do you need to vary the Hamiltonians? Okay, so now, um, Many of you, you know, may have uh, read about uh, a company called D-Wave uh, in Vancouver, which has actually so far spent uh, more than $150 million toward, you know, building sort of special purpose uh, quantum devices, which are just for trying to implement, you know, uh, some version of this adiabatic algorithm. Okay, they, they call it quantum annealing because it's like the adiabatic algorithm, but sort of noisier at a, at a finite temperature. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so there are, you know, there are a lot of questions and a lot of, you know, uh, uh, sort of debates people have been having about these devices. You know, you may know that they've sold two of them, one to Lockheed Martin, uh, the other to Google. And uh, because of that, there have now been independent uh, uh, studies done on these devices. So we know a lot more than we did just a few years ago about uh, what they're doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, you know, there are two big issues to keep in mind, you know, when discussing the, uh, the D-Wave devices, right? The first is the hardware issue, right? And this is what everyone wants to ask about, you know, is it a true quantum computer or not? Okay, right? And, you know, th that, that's, uh, um, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, well, it's sort of a, a semantic question, right? Uh, because, you know, it, it, so it is a computer, you know, it's a device, you know, it, 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 it is able to, what it does, it, you know, it, it has a chip inside, I've actually walked inside of it. Uh, it has a, uh, 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 um, you know, most of it is co a cooling system. It cools down to about 20 millikelvin. And then in the middle, there's a chip uh, uh, with uh, some superconducting Josephson Junction qubits. And, um, you know, the latest model has about 500 of them. And, um, uh, you know, and, and they just, they try to, you know, using this adiabatic evolution, they try to sort of relax to their lowest energy state, thereby solving some optimization problem that you encoded into the chip by setting the couplings uh, between adjacent qubits. Um, now, it definitely does produce solutions to the optimization problem that, you know, are often, you know, uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, it, uh, you know, and there are definitely quantum effects that are relevant at some level to explaining what this device does, certainly at the level of one qubit, probably even, you know, at the level of eight qubits. Okay, uh, there is no evidence so far that this device is doing anything faster than you could do it with a classical computer, uh, or, or for that matter, you know, um, um, uh, you know, as far as we've seen in, in public, anyway, that the, uh, that the scaling behavior looks different. Okay, so, uh, you know, now, now part of that, uh, you know, you know I, mean, I mean, and, you know, and this is sort of consistent with, you know, what a lot of us sort of thought from the beginning, not that many people listened, but, um, but the, um, uh, you know, the, I mean, I mean the, the, the obvious, you know, uh, issue here is, you know, is the one of hardware, right, that, you know, the qubits that they have are, you know, only staying coherent for, uh, for a matter of nanoseconds. You know, and, uh, and, you know, so, so there's, uh, there's a lot of sort of noise in the system. You know, you're not really doing this true, you know, I guess, uh, adiabatic evolution. Okay, but, uh, uh, you know, and, and actually some of you may have heard that Google recently invested in the, the group of John Martinez, which has superconducting qubits that have 10,000 times the coherence time of D waves, although, you know, they haven't, they haven't yet integrated a large number of them. Okay, so, you know, so these hardware issues may, you know, may ul ultimately be solved by just getting, you know, better and better qubits. But to me, the even, you know, deeper th issue is the algorithmic one. Okay, suppose, you know, forget about D-Wave. Suppose you had a perfectly functioning, perfectly coherent quantum computer, and you ran this adiabatic algorithm. How much speed up could you expect for NP-complete problems? Uh, well, you know, we still don't, you know, even there, we, you know, we, you know, we still don't know that you would see a, a real speed up. And in fact, people have done um, very careful numerical studies of this. And uh, what determines uh, how long you, you have to, uh, you know, how much time you need to take in transitioning between these two Hamiltonians is what's called the minimum eigenvalue gap. 
uh, uh, the, you know, uh, um, this is sort of the, the, the minimum gap between the smallest and second smallest eigenvalues of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian. And uh, if, if, if this ever gets exponentially small, then you need to run the algorithm for exponential time. Okay, and when you look at, let's say, random instances of 3SAT or of some other, you know, a, a canonical NP-complete problem, you do, you sometimes find that indeed this gap gets exponentially small. It looks like the, these two lines, you know, are touching each other, but not quite. Uh, so, you know, when, um, um, you know, Fari sort of started to notice this, you know, he told me that he asked uh, an expert in condensed matter physics, um, well, look, based on your experience with, you know, similar systems, because condensed matter physicists have like a century of experience studying these spectral gaps, said, do you think that this gap is going to decrease polynomially or exponentially with the number of particles in our system? And the expert thought about it and said, I think it's going to decrease exponentially. And of course, that wasn't the answer that Farhi wanted to hear. So he said, why do you say that? And he said, well, it's because otherwise your algorithm would work. Okay, so I think that there's, there's actually something deep there, uh, which is that, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, once we've seen enough examples of sort of nature, you know, trying to prevent us from solving NP-complete problems, you know, we might just sort of uh, turn things around and just say, let's say we start from the premise that NP-complete problems are hard. What implications does that have for other issues? Okay, uh, you know, and so, you know, we might even, you know, formulate something that, you know, I'll grandly call, you know, the no super search postulate. Uh, you know, so Avi talked before about P not equal to NP as a natural law, right? Here, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to go further than that. I want to say, you know, I conjecture that there is no physical means to solve NP complete problems in polynomial time. I mean, you know, because I'm a computer scientist, you know, I call this a conjecture. I've learned that there's a, you know, a, a cultural difference. Physicists would call this a law, okay? But, uh, uh, so, you know, this would include P not equal to NP as a special case, but it's stronger. Uh, you know, and it's no longer a purely mathematical conjecture like P not equal to NP, but also a claim about the laws of physics. You know, and now it, suppose we invoke this, you know, what would it explain? Uh, well, um, you know, it would explain, as I said, why the adiabatic systems have small spectral gaps, why does protein folding and all these other, you know, uh, spin lattices get stuck in metastable states. Uh, why is the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics precisely linear? Uh, it turns out one can show that if there were even the smallest nonlinearity in the equations of quantum mechanics, so like if the, the evolution of the vector of amplitudes could be, you know, a nonlinear transformation, okay, then one generically could solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. One could also then send signals faster than light, okay? So one could do a lot of amazing things, but, you know, uh, um, you know, the hardness of NP-complete problems is sort of, if you like, another reason why we should be suspicious of that. You know, like, you know, why are there not closed time-like curves? Okay, uh, but, you know, I know you're asking, you know, but can computational complexity engage even more deeply with the content of modern physics? You know, what other new insights has it given the physicists? So thank you for asking that. Uh, so, you know, I'll give, you know, a few examples. Uh, so, um, you know, some people have asked, well, could quantum computing sort of help us resolve which interpretation of quantum mechanics is the right one? Okay, well, so David Deutsch, who is the sort of, uh, one of along with Feynman, one of the founders of quantum computing, uh, uh, has a famous argument for what's called the many worlds interpretation. Many worlds is what says that, you know, all of these different branches of the superposition are equally real, you know, and every time you measure a quantum state, you are literally splitting into two parallel copies. You know, despite how it sounds, this is in some sense the conservative interpretation of quantum mechanics. You know, this is just sort of the one that, you know, where you don't have to add anything to the math. That's just sort of what the math wants. And, you know, Deutsch goes a little further. He says, to those who still cling to a single universe worldview, I issue this challenge, explain how Shor's algorithm works. When Shor's algorithm is factored a number using 10 to the 500 or so times the computational resources that can be seen to be present, where was the number factored? How and where was the computation performed? Um, 
So, you know, I think this is, this is an interesting argument. Well, you know, there's also an interesting, uh, uh, res I don't view it as decisive. There's an interesting response that I'd like to suggest, which is, you know, to those who cling to a many universe worldview, will explain why can you only do factoring? Why are the NP complete problems still hard? Um, you know, you might think that if every universe could just try out a different solution, then, you know, NP-complete problems would be easy. So maybe, you know, quantum mechanics is like this intermediate possibility that just none of our sort of pre-quantum language is a very good fit for. Okay, uh, you know, and there are other sort of, um, interpretive debate. So there are, you know, all these different mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics, like the Schrodinger picture, the Heisenberg picture, the Feynman sum over histories picture, uh, you know, and these are all mathematically equivalent. Okay, and so you might wonder, how could you ever distinguish between them? Because they lead to all of the same experimental predictions. Okay, but actually one way to differentiate them is in terms of the computational complexity, you know, uh, 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 to simulate what they're talking about. You know, the Schrodinger uh, picture, which has a wave function, the Heisenberg picture, which has a density matrix, these both require exponential time to simulate with a classical computer, but also exponential memory because you need to write down this giant object. The Feynman picture uh, still requires exponential time, but it only requires polynomial memory uh, because uh, you, you just keep reusing the same memory over and over to compute more terms in your sum. And this, in fact, is how you prove that, like, quantum polynomial time can be simulated in classical polynomial space. Uh, so I like to say that Richard Feynman won the, the Nobel Prize in Physics for proving that complexity class containment, uh, but, you know, the, okay, I guess there was more to it than that. Um, okay, uh, you know, there's also a Bohmian mechanics, uh, which is an interpretation that, where you say that in addition to the quantum state, there are also sort of real classical trajectories for the particles. Okay, but you so arrange things that these classical uh, 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 you know, particles are just buffeted around or guided by the quantum state in such a way that whenever you look at the classical particles, you know, the predictions of quantum mechanics are precisely reproduced. Okay, so again, you know, by construction, this is experimentally completely indistinguishable from standard quantum mechanics. Okay, so you might wonder, you know, how could we ever, you know, sort of pass judgment on it then as scientists. Well, one thing that we could do, one thing that, uh, that I did in 2005 is that I looked at what would be the computational complexity of sampling the entire trajectory of the particles in a hidden variable theory like Bohmian mechanics. And I gave evidence that this would be a hard, an intractable problem even for a quantum computer. Okay, a quantum computer could, you know, calculate where the particles were at any one time. But in order to get right the correlations between where the particles are at time A and where they are at time B, uh, you would need the ability to, for example, br uh, break any collision-resistant hash function, uh, solve the graph isomorphism problem in polynomial time, in general, you know, solve any problem in uh, statistical zero knowledge, if you know what that is. Uh, you know, that's not quite up to NP-complete problems, which I wouldn't know how to do even then, but this is more than we think can be done even with a quantum computer. And some of my other work gave evidence that this type of problem is, you know, is likely to be intractable even for a quantum computer in, in general. Okay, so again, you know, empirically indistinguishable, but theories like Bohmian mechanics are sort of asking for, a sh uh, they're positing a mathematical structure that takes more computational resources to simulate than quantum mechanics itself does. All right, so I wanted to say something about uh, two of Avi's favorite functions. These are the determinant and the permanent of a matrix, uh, which, you know, the, perm uh, the determinant, you've, you've all seen, the permanent is the same thing except without the minus signs. Okay, now, you may have also heard that there are two fundamental types of particles. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, okay, now, now, despite the similarity of their definition, you know, these functions differ dramatically in terms of computation. The determinant can be easily computed, say, in n cubed time by diagonalizing the matrix. If you want to be precise, even in n to the 2.373 time, okay? Um, 
The permanent, uh, by uh, result of someone you heard from this morning, is uh, sharp P complete, which means that it is, uh, Valiant famously showed, it is at least as hard as any combinatorial counting problem. If you had a fast algorithm to calculate the permanent, then you could not only solve NP-complete problems, but count the number of solutions to any NP-complete problem in polynomial time. Okay, now, you may have also heard that there are these two basic types of particles in the universe, uh, fer fermions, here's a picture of some fermions, and uh, bosons, here's a picture of some bosons, that's the sun. Okay, so, uh, now, you know, the amazing, you know, fact that I still can't get over is that these are, you know, inextricably linked to the determinant and the permanent, respectively. Okay, uh, if you want to know the amplitude for n identical fermions to go from one, you know, input state to some output state, you have to calculate the determinant of an n by n matrix. Okay, for bosons, you calculate the permanent of an n by n matrix. Um, and this is what gives rise to all of the other differences between fermions and bosons that you may have heard of, like that, for no, you know, no two fermions can be in the same place, in the same state at the same time. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. And so they repel each other, and so, you know, fermions are good for making up matter like this. Okay, it's because of these minus signs. Uh, you know, bosons don't have the minus signs, and so they can all pile up in the same state at the same time as, for example, the light from a laser does. Okay, uh, so, uh, and now one can push, you know, now, now you may say if, if, you know, determinant is easily computable and permanent is hard to compute, then does that say something about the computational complexity of simulating fermions versus simulating bosons? Well, in fact, it does. So, you know, Avi, you know, once, you know, p uh, said 15 years ago, well, you know, what I can say for sure is the bosons got the harder job, right? And uh, so, you know, since then, we've, you know, many of us have labored hard to formalize uh, Avi's wisecrack. And um, so, uh, um, Valiant actually uh, uh, showed that if you have a system of free fermions, that can be simulated in classical polynomial time ultimately sort of using the fact that the determinant is in P. Uh, Terhal and DiVincenzo are physicists who sort of explained that he had been talking about fermions. Um, uh, so, and then uh, my work on boson sampling uh, with my student Alex Arkhipov uh, five years ago uh, basically said that for uh, 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 systems of bosons, you have a hardness result. Just even if you just took a bunch of non-interacting photons that you sent through a network of interferometers, uh, you, you know, that's not a universal quantum computer, probably, but uh, you can then sample probability distributions such that if you could sample those same distributions efficiently using a classical computer, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse. If you don't know what that means, uh, it's bad. You can take my word for it. Okay, uh, you know, and since then there have actually been experimental demonstrations of this boson sampling, so far with only three to four photons, but they have confirmed that indeed, you know, their amplitudes are given by the permanence of three by three or four by four matrices. Uh, you know, if you want to do something that's classically hard, you probably need at least 20 or 30 photons, and you know, if you want to outperform a classical computer. You know, and that, that might be possible. Uh, you know, people are, that, that, that's a great problem that people are working on. Uh, so the last thing that I wanted to, to talk about was uh, uh, computational complexity and the black hole information loss problem, which is maybe the single most striking application so far of uh, complexity theory to fundamental physics. Okay, so uh, you know, I'm sure, sure you've heard, you know, if you don't believe me, you can go watch the movie. Uh, 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 Stephen Hawking in 1975 uh, showed that uh, black holes are not completely black. They give very, very slowly give off uh, radiation. And, you know, according to quantum field theory, this radiation looks completely thermal, which means totally uncorrelated with whatever stuff fell into the black hole. However, you know, that would violate quantum mechanics, which says that evolution is always unitary and reversible, so information is always preserved. Right, you know, information can't just be deleted from the universe. Okay, so, uh, so which means if quantum mechanics is to be upheld, then the Hawking radiation somehow has to encode the quantum state of whatever fell into the black hole. Okay, so people have thought for 40 years about how that could happen, and the sort of modern point of view, which came out of Susskind and Hooft and others, 
in the mid-1990s is called black hole complementarity. And what it says is that in the true theory of quantum gravity, whatever it is, you know, the Hawking radiation should just be some kind of scrambled re-encoding of the same quant exactly the same quantum states that are also at, at the same time inside the black hole. Now, it's not a copy of those quantum states. Okay, it can't be a copy because in quantum mechanics, there's something called the no-cloning theorem. It says that you can't copy, you know, an unknown quantum state. And, you know, if someone could see the copy outside and then jump in and then see the second copy inside the black hole, that would violate quantum mechanics. Okay, so it has to be exactly the same state, but it's just being outside the black hole and going into the black hole are just two different ways of measuring that state. Okay, that sounds crazy, but that's, you know, this is what people, uh, you know, have believed for like 20 years. Okay, but then um, two years ago, uh, uh, there was uh, this, what's called the firewall paradox, which said actually this complementarity leads to something that sounds crazy, okay? Uh, namely, if the black hole interior is built out of the same qubits, the same quantum states that came out as the Hawking radiation, well then why can't we do something to those Hawking ra uh, radiation qubits, so apply some unitary transformation to them. Um, you know, we'll have to wait a while for the enough Hawking radiation to come out for this to do this, you know, for an astrophysical black hole. It'll take about 10 to the 70th years. Okay, but assume we have a really long grant. Okay, so we <laughs> collect all the Hawking radiation. We um, we then root it into a quantum computer. We do some very particular kind of measurement on it. And then, um, you know, let's say Alice, does, you know, the observer traditionally called Alice, does all of this. And then she jumps into the black hole after doing that. And then there's a calculation in like well understood quantum field theory that says that by doing this, she should have completely destroyed the structure of space time inside of the black hole. So when she jumps in, she should not even see a smooth space time at all. She should, you know, forget about the singularity. Uh, she should just die immediately as soon as she hits the event horizon and just reach an end of, of space time there. So this is what's called the firewall. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, there have been all sorts of, you know, responses to this puzzle, you know. You know, everyone, everyone agrees that it's trivial and it's not a problem, but no one can agree about why not, okay. And um, uh, to me, you know, one of the, uh, maybe the, 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 one of the most uh, interesting responses came from Daniel Harlow and Patrick Hayden last year. Uh, Harlow is a string theorist, uh, Hayden is a quantum information person, and what they said is that, well, sure, there is some unitary transformation that uh, Alice could apply to the Hawking radiation that would generate a firewall inside the event horizon. But how long would it take her to apply it? And they argued that very plausibly it would take an amount of time which is exponential in the number of qubits in the black hole, which means, you know, that we're not talking here 10 to the 70th years. We're talking 2 to the 10 to the 70th years. Okay, which means that, you know, Alice would not have made a dent in the problem before the black hole had long ago evaporated anyway. So there's nothing to jump into. So there's, you know, there's no firewall, no problem, right? So, you know, you could say, okay, so maybe, you know, maybe the problem solved, right? And people say, you know, how could, you know, how could this be? It can't be that, you know, that, that a contradiction in the laws of physics is okay just because it would take exponential computation time to reveal it. Right, that can't be, okay, but that's not what Harlow and Aiden are saying, right? The contradict, you know, uh, you know, the, you know the, the, what the firewall problem points out is just a breakdown of, of effective quantum field theory, which people knew from the beginning is going to break down anyway if you probed at high enough energies, let's say. And what all they're saying is that, you know, not only does quantum field theory break down in the limit of extremely high energies, it, all, it could also break down in the limit of exponentially hard computations, okay? And so this is, you know, it, you know, it, it is kind of a radical intrusion of, you know, complexity considerations into, you know, high energy physics. So not everyone likes it, but, you know, uh, you know, I think, you know, people in the quantum gravity community, you know, have been 
sort of avidly discussing and, and debating this proposal. Uh, now, you know, but what, 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 uh, what sort of um, within my purview is to tell you how did Harlow and Hayden argue for this conclusion? Well, they gave a reduction, as we do in computer science. They showed that if Alice could achieve a, a plausible formulation of the uh, decoding experiment that you'd have to do to the Hawking radiation, then once again she could break collision resistant hash functions and solve graph isomorphism and do all those other problems in statistical zero knowledge that seem beyond what even a quantum computer can do. Uh, now, very recently, uh, I was able to strengthen Harlow and Hayden's argument to show that if Alice could do this, then she could even invert any one-way function, which is sort of almost as bad as being able to solve an NP-complete problem. Okay, so I haven't even touched on the huge interplay between computational complexity and condensed matter physics, which is a whole area called quantum Hamiltonian complexity. Here's a picture to just impress you with the depth of what we know about all that. Since I'm running out of time, I think I'll skip it unless uh, there's a question about it. You know, we, we use complexity to even just to define what we mean by a quantum state being simple or complicated. And that has all sorts of beautiful implications for understanding the ground states of complicated Hamiltonians that you know, can arise in, uh, in, 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 in solid state and, and, and in all kinds of many body physics. Okay, uh, but let me just summarize now with uh, my p diagram of uh, reductionism revised. Okay, so the traditional picture of scientific reductionism would be that at the very bottom we've got quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, general relativity, you know, the fundamental laws of physics. Now using those we can build things like semiconductors, we can do applied physics. Uh, using those, we can, you know, integrate lots of them, build computers, uh, and then we can write operating systems and compilers for those computers. And then once we have all of that stuff, then maybe at the top, maybe we can think about what we want to do with those computers or what we can't do with them. Okay, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, a plausible di diagram that you can draw of sort of the relationships between these, you know, different fields. But, you know, we're, you know there, there is something that we're leaving out below physics, you know, there's math, right? It, you know, that's the bottom of everything. And, you know, what I've tried to show you in this talk is that, you know, in more and more cases, you know, I think of real interest, the kind of math that we want to, to use, you know, in order even just to understand things about fundamental physics is math related to the limits of computation. All right, so I'll end there. Thanks.